Well, welcome everybody. We are back for now Fridays at 11 a.m. Um, we, first of all, a big thank you to all of our speakers who have had to modify their schedules from Tuesday to Friday. And uh, Dr. Driver is no different. He was very kind. When I reached out to him, he immediately wrote back and said, absolutely, I'm in to giving this talk. Uh, obviously, this is a, a very important topic. Uh, I've always been very curious uh, about this topic because you hear a lot about it. And I think people don't really understand what to really do in these situations. Um, and so I think it's a great topic. While uh, Dr. Driver is speaking, I will, I will be um, putting in the CME for today, which I believe is uh, 17439, but just uh, hold on and I'll, I'll add that in. But without any further ado, uh, everybody welcome Dr. Brian Driver from Hennepin Healthcare. So Brian, if you want to make a further intro, thank you so much for joining us and take it away. Yes, thanks for having me. So I'm Brian Driver. I'm an emergency physician at uh, Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis. So a little colder than Florida right now. It's 40 and raining. So I'm dreaming, dreaming of the beach. But uh, thanks for having me. And uh, we'll talk about sedative dose and, and RSI and post intubation hypotension. Uh, I have no disclosures. We all know that hypotension is bad for, you know, in general, uh, particularly in trauma patients and patients with TBI. And as clinicians, we particularly want to avoid worsening or causing hypotension in someone who's sick, injured, uh, in shock. And of course, that's something we prioritize a lot of our resuscitation around. When people are performing RSI, the most common meds are atomidate and ketamine. Um, the normal dose for atomidate is 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram. The normal dose for ketamine, as you guys all know, is one to two milligrams per kilogram. But uh, even today, and but more, more often historically, other agents were used for induction for RSI, propofol, midazolam, these are drugs that have a more strong dose dependent relationship with hypotension. So when these are used in patients with shock, uh, there is a very clear recommendation to reduce their dose. Um, thankfully, these are not used as often uh, for RSI induction, but that sort of thought process of, hey, we better reduce the dose has actually carried over to atomidate and ketamine. And so the, the question is, should we reduce the dose of atomidate? Should we reduce the dose of ketamine in someone who's either in shock or at risk of shock? And there's not a lot of data, but uh, there actually is some pretty strong recommendations. Life in the Fast Lane, which is an emergency medicine sort of blog and online textbook. There's other blog posts and even the up-to-date section on this for induction agents recommends reducing the dose of ketamine and atomidate uh, in the setting of shock or patients at risk of shock. And so without there being a lot of data out there, in fact, there's almost none, uh, we thought we'd, we'd take a look at see whether this is true. So we really sought to, to determine if the weight-based dose, the milligram per kilogram dose of Atomidate or ketamine, we're not looking to really compare the two drugs, but these are, since these are drugs of interest since it's what's used. If the milligram per kilogram dose was associated with hypotension uh, shortly after intubation. And we use data from the National Emergency Airway Registry, which is a, a big conglomeration of centers that all um, basically have the clinician complete a detailed data collection form after intubation to give details on the patient, who they were, what their hemodynamic status was, how the intubation go, what was used, what were the complications. And so it's a really big database. You can uh, get some really detailed data from this. So in this database, we looked at uh, patients who were 14 years and older who received ketamine or atomidate for intubation. We excluded those uh, who really didn't fit in the, the population of interest, like those who had topical anesthesia approach. We also excluded people if we couldn't figure out you know, whether they had hypotension or if we didn't know their weight or their dose or what they were like before intubation. There was a sensitivity analysis that includes, includes all these patients we'll get to later, but in general, uh, we wanted to figure out uh, uh, we wanted to only include patients if we could actually figure out what happened to them. So as I said, the intubating clinician puts in detailed data right after intubation. And this does include what the patient's hemodynamics were 
right before intubation and whether they met the outcome. Of course, they also include sedative dose, patient weight, that sort of thing. The main outcome we were interested in is post-innovation hypotension, and secondarily, whether this hypotension was treated with something like fluids or vasopressors. Um, as I mentioned before, we analyzed etomidate and ketamine separately. Uh, there's a lot of data out there comparing the two, but because this is not randomized data, we didn't want to uh, try to make any comparisons. We're really just interested in, in dose and the effect of the dose. And we did build a multivariable model um, adjusting for things like age, gender, how quickly the patient needed to be intubated, what was their hemodynamic status, was it difficult, and then what hospital were they intubated in. So it's a big data set. <clears throat> uh, 19,000 patients in the registry, and of those, there were a little over 14,000 who received etomidate or ketamine. Etomidate being much more common with 12,000 compared to about 2,000 uh, patients who got ketamine. And we'll look at Atomidate first here. So of the 12,000 or so patients who got Atomidate, uh, about 2,000 had hypotension, so about 16% hypotension rate with, with Atomidate. One of the biggest differences between those who didn't have hypotension and those who did was their pre-intubation hemodynamic status, not surprisingly. So those who were Normal, they, you know, they're more likely to be normotensive or hypotensive compared to the patients who didn't have hypotension. Sedative dose really was pretty similar, 0 0.28 versus 0 0.27. Uh, reduced sedative dose was a little bit more common in the hypotension group, but increased sedative dose was roughly common at 8%, roughly similar. This graph really, I think, tells the story um, of dose and hypotension. So the y-axis is the weight-based dose. And the x-axis shows on the left, those without hypotension, on the right, those with hypotension. And then each dot is a patient. So you can see the spread of doses looks really similar between groups. Like there's not a big difference in spread for, you know, if we were going to say that hypotension or the, that atomidate caused hypotension, we would expect maybe the average dose to be a little bit higher on that side, which we're not seeing. And indeed, when we adjust for all of these other variables, the adjusted odds ratio for automidate causing hypertension is 0 0.95. So really close to one with a 95% confidence interval that spans one, essentially saying, okay, the automidate dose is not what's associated with hypertension. It's something else. Uh, looking at ketamine, we see a very similar story of pre-intubation hemodynamic status. We see the sedative doses uh, are really similar, 1.34 milligrams per kilogram without hypertension. 1.32 with hypotension. Again, reduced sedative dose, a little bit more common in those with hypotension, but not drastically so, and increased sedative dose, roughly similar. The graph has fewer patients, but it really looks similar to the atomidate graph. You can see there's a big spread of doses all over the place. There's no clear dose relationship here. And indeed, we look at multivariable modeling, really similar to atomidate, odds ratio near one, confidence interval spans one by a good margin. The variables we did see that were associated with hypotension uh, were age. So if you're older, you're more likely to have hypotension. If you're intubated for shock, you're more likely to have hypotension, of course. And if you were hypotensive beforehand, which a lot of times, as you all know, we try to correct this before intubation. So some of these patients who are listed as hypotensive actually were corrected before RSI, but still had post-intubation hypotension. So those are the factors that were associated, which of course, none of those are surprising. Um, but sedative dose was not one of those variables that was important. We also did a few sensitiv uh, sensitivity analyses to make sure our findings were actually robust. So first, first analysis we did is we took out anybody who had hypotension before intubation, because that, that might bias it if they already going to be the primary outcome at the time of intubation. Second analysis we did, we included only patients intubated for shock, so that highest risk group which is ostensibly when you're reducing the dose is most important. Third analysis we did um, was actually a natural experiment. So there were a few centers that basically only gave 20 milligrams of tomidate. They didn't go up, they didn't go down, they didn't do it for patient weight, they didn't adjust for patient hemodynamics. They're basically like, hey, we're just giving 20. So it created a natural experiment where the dose 
depended on the patient weight rather than the physician decision or, or anything else. And then the fourth sensitivity analysis is more boring. We basically just use multiple imputation to include all patients who got a, a ketamine or a tomidate and had the computer model fill in the gaps so we could include all 14,000 patients. Um, we we're basically able to include a lot of patients in each analysis. I'll go through them all. But uh, the first analysis where we excluded all, all patients with hypotension, similar results, no difference. Uh, or the dose was not associated for either drug. Second analysis where we included only patients with shock, again, dose not associated with hypotension. The third sensitivity analysis, I think, is one of the more interesting ones because it is this natural experiment. So we found five EDs uh, totaling 4,000 patients where basically most doses were just 20 milligrams of tomidate. Just kind of taking that thinking off the table, giving 20 milligrams of tomidate to everybody. One ED even that did that for 95% of intubations. Um, the median dose for all these patients was similar to the main cohort, 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, a good portion received a reduced dose. The post innovation hypotension rate in this and these centers was really similar to the to the overall cohort, fifteen point six percent. And in the multivariable model, again, dose is not associated with hypotension. So, kind of looking at all these data, these are observational data, but a lot of patients and a lot of sensitivity analysis that really showed the dose of the medicine was not associated with with post innovation hypotension which sort of makes sense because there's not a strong pharmacologic basis for atomidate or ketamine to cause hypotension like propofol or midazolam do. You know, there's some notion of does ketamine depress myocardial contractility? Does ketamine worsen shock? There's some data out there, but it's not as strong of a pharmacologic basis. And the question is just sedation in general cause hypotension because patients are losing their pain, their sensation of hypoxia, is that what's causing hypotension in these patients? Or is it a directive effect of a drug on a receptor? And is the dose going to matter? And I think these data argue that it's not really the dose that does it. It's something else. It's either their underlying hemodynamics, it's their, they're not feeling pain anymore, something like that. But this, this study included a lot of patients. And I think we can, we can say that there's no large effect of dose um, and that these findings don't support current expert guidance to reduce the doses of these agents in critically ill patients with or at risk for uh, hypotension. So thanks. I'll, I'm happy to discuss this further. Take any questions. Brian, amazing. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for doing that and for contributing to the evidence base on this. My, my question is, uh, I and, and again, I know you had it up there, maybe I just missed it, but so the overall hypotension rate with the time of day was around six, 15, 16%. What, what was the, 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 the ketamine total percentage? Yeah, ketamine was something like 29%. Right. So that, that, that's, that's my question there is that um, although there was no difference with, with the dose, what do you make of that uh, differential there? Yeah, I think that's a little tricky. I know there, there was another publication within the past couple of years by April at all that looked at it and found that ketamine had a, a lot higher hypotension rate. And I think it's a little tricky because I think people maybe more often reach for ketamine in those shocked patients. And so you can't, that selection, that selection sort of bias, mm -hmm. you can't just get rid of it in a multivariable model. Um, Cause all the randomized trials, you know, I think there was, there's a large one out of Texas in the past couple of years. There was one out of France. There's some smaller ones don't show that big difference in hypotension rates. Um, so I don't know quite what to make of it. Uh, I'm skeptical that there would be a big difference between ketamine and atomidate, like a 13% difference. I'm thinking that probably is more likely explained by just difference in patient selection, but it's, I don't think we know definitively. So, and then great. And then the other one is um, with respect to peri-intubation arrest, do you have any detail or data on that variable with respect to each of these medications? You know, we didn't look at that in this trial um, there was a publication in resuscitation uh, again by April at all. And, um, I can't remember which variables. I don't think drug type was one of the, the variables that was associated with arrest, but that is a good question. I'll have to look into that. 
Yeah, because when, when you when you look at the Jeff Jarvis uh you know paper and looking at you know RSI versus DSI and you know which is what we've now moved to giving the ketamine and then using that three that three minute period to make sure that the patient is oxygenated adequately and making sure that the blood pressure is adequate and which includes giving fluids, giving push pressure before we give the paralytic. And um, so, you know, really my, my, I have two questions. Number one is, um, is the hypotension occurring because of the positive pressure ventilations that are maybe being given inappropriately or because let's say the patient is a severe asthmatic and then you paralyze them and then you, you know, you know, effectively cut off their RV filling, you cut out their cardiac output um, immediately afterwards. So, and ketamine would be used, for example, in that, let's say severe asthmatic and could potentially that could have been the reason why there's more post intubation hypotension in that subgroup. So did you look at patient type or etiology of intubation that, that, that required intubation here as well? We didn't, we didn't drill down to that level. Um, I think we looked at medical versus trauma and there, there was no difference, but we didn't drill down to like asthma versus others. I don't know if there's enough patients in this database to do that, but that is an interesting question. I'll have to, to look. And then, and then I'll, last one, then I'll shut up because there's some really smart people on this call that I want to hear from. Um, but what about the patient who is hypotensive? And obviously the goal would, would be to correct that hypotension before mm -hmm. you intubate them. But, you know, based on this, on this data, what would you say to us regarding the hypotensive patient and should the dose be reduced in those, in that patient population or not, or does it matter at all? My reading uh, of this data and, and the existing literature is that there's just no strong evidence that that reducing the dose is going to make a big difference for hypotension. I think it's much more likely that you need to make sure they're fluid resuscitated, pressors if you need to, um, and whatever other resuscitation they need. Whether if you can, re you know, I don't think there's a huge downside to reducing the dose necessarily, but I don't, you know, there's already enough going on in a resuscitation. You don't want to do math. You don't want to do something that's not going to be beneficial to the patient. I, I don't think there's enough support to reduce the dose that it's worth that extra step during the whole resuscitation process. Perfect. I, I was hoping you would say that. Um, so I'm, I'm a believer in that too. And I, I love this, you know, kind of standard dose of Atomidate. Um, I'm going to call on somebody because I know he's, he's, he's out there and he's uh, very well respected when it comes to uh, pre-hospital airway. So Eric, Eric Jager, you mind um, unmuting yourself and giving us your, your input on this? Um, Eric has joined our webinar. He's been a speaker on the webinar. Uh, I value your opinion. Eric, what do you, what do you think about uh, Dr. Driver's uh, research and any comments? Hi, Peter. Uh, I think it's fascinating research, and I think it is going to better inform our practice. I suspect, um, but we don't have the data, and it would be great to get it, that the positive pressure ventilation just both poorly performed and even appropriately performed has a bigger impact than uh, we had anticipated. And this just adds to the data that, as you said, uh, pour some cold water on the practice of cutting the ketamine dose in half or the atomidate dose in half for uh, patients that, uh, you know, were concerned or older or shocky to begin with. Uh, it's just awesome to get this data. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So, um, Brian, we have a question from Dr. Daya, um, out of Portland. So do we know how the blood pressure was measured since accuracy is often an issue? And he asked, did you see if the double, if double dosing of paralytic was also something that was a factor? So if you can, address those two things? Good question. So this, there was no standardization of blood pressure management. So it's a basic, you know, basic standard of care, ED measurement. And we relied on the treating clinician to report whether there was post-innovation hypotension defined as a systolic of less than hundred. So uh, I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure is the short answer. I assume that the, the clinician put things in the right clinical context and only selected that they had hypertension if they actually did and it wasn't a spurious reading but I, I can't say that for sure and then we did not adjust for the actual dose of the paralytic here we do have that in the data set but we didn't 
incorporate the, the paralytic dose into this analysis, but that is interesting. And was that just thinking that maybe increased paralytic dose is, has some negative hemodynamic effects? And, and, and also I'm going to add on to that because, and I know that some people don't like to hear when I say this, but we have in our protocols in our DSI protocol, the ability for our paramedics to, to, to go ketamine only in, especially in the cases like the severe asthmatic. And uh, we're in the process of looking at our data, but we have, we have a lot of ketamine only intubations. I'm wondering, were there any in this data set? And I'm, I'm curious if, if that had an impact um, on, on the blood pressure findings. There were some ketamine only in this data set. And actually we published a paper on those patients in the journal of emergency medicine, maybe a year or two ago, Oh, it's only like 60. So it's a really small number. And when we looked at those 60 patients, they had lower first attempt success, more complications, more hypoxia, whether that's just because they were they were already tough to begin with, it could be, um, but we didn't see any sign in the in that data set. And there's not that not a ton of patients. It, it is more patients than it's ever been described before, but still, it's it's only sixty patients. Um, so we we can't say anything too smart about about that, except for that definitely more data would be helpful. I have to I have to look at that paper. So you're saying that you had more complications because of the fact that either the patient, you know, still had a, 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 a tight jaw, they still had a gag, they ended up becoming hypoxic. That's what you're saying. Yeah, more airway complications. Potentially, yeah. I think the title of the paper is uh, "Success and Complications of the Ketamine Only Intubation Method." I'm pretty sure that's the title of the paper. And and we don't know. You know, this is just a, this is a registry. The, the the ketamine paper I'm referring to is from this same data source, uh, the NEAR database. So we don't know if the complications were because of the ketamine didn't allow enough relaxation and that's what caused the complication or if, if the patient was like so hard to begin with and that's why they used ketamine only and that's why it was hard. So we, we can't distinguish those two from the data set, just that it didn't seem to be a panacea. Like the ketamine only didn't seem to just miraculously solve solve the problems. Gotcha. All right, um, I'm gonna bring in see, uh, Dr. Pepe. Uh, Paul, are you available? Based on what Eric mentioned with the positive pressure uh, ventilation, you know, this is something that you've been talking about for quite a long time. Would you mind uh, adding some color into that as far as- Yeah, they brought up all the good points, like what tool are you using to measure the blood pressure and was that standardized and was it the same thing? That's one thing. Uh, and I think the the age thing we brought up of that it wasn't surprising with our age because sometimes people won't drop their blood pressure up if they can uh, hemodynamically accommodate that by like getting their heart rate up and you can't do it when you're on beta blockers and all that. But the most important part I think you're getting as I think is the biggest issue is that people are not controlling for uh, you know how they do positive pressure ventilation and you know in the studies I did back well, where several decades ago. Um, you know, that even if you were at a point where you would, where you might not have even innovated the person, they had severe hemodynamic effects when your preload is down. Um, so in animal models, when we just gave them moderate hemorrhage, uh, it severely impaired their coronary blood flow, brain flow, and all that kind of thing. Um, and that, in fact, the patients who were, who were sick enough that we would have innovated, at least in the laboratory, what we found was that was um, lethal, essentially, most of the time to get the positive pressure press, at least um, if you're doing it at a level of about, um, you know, like what, what people consider normal breaths once every, let's say, I don't know, uh, 10 seconds, or I mean, sorry, every six seconds or so, uh, versus, uh, and we also look at brain oximetry, et cetera, during that period of time, all the above. Um, and so, yeah, it's, you got, we are very sensitive to positive pressure ventilation. You just have to give them enough breath to keep the lungs in a inflated state and allow blood to flow through the lungs and not have them deflate and cause increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And the last thing is that, uh, you hey, by the way, nice presentation today. This is really great stuff and very thoughtful over the way you did it, and especially introducing the various uh, issues about survival, et cetera. But the, um, I, I did do some studies. We did some studies, this very same thing, in, in more of an in-hospital uh, circumstance for these patients um, in various ICUs and operating rooms and so on. And uh, what was very interesting about that is that we did find more of the hemodynamic effect from ketamine, right? 
But the irony of the whole thing is we had better outcomes with it. And this is, this is a well-thrown trial on a lot of levels. And uh, so uh, I'll try to get that paper to everybody if I can find it somewhere. We did at UT Southwestern some years ago. So it was interesting. It said it was, uh, our conclusion was that it appeared to be acutely less stable human family than Atomidae, but uh, we had significantly higher likelihood of survival after emergency and tracheal innovation. And I don't think it was because the uh, people using, uh, when we used ketamine, uh, ketamine we were uh, controlling for the ventilation. I think once you get that done, it's all hell can break loose. Uh, you know, once, uh, you know, someone gets a tube in because now they have a, a tool to get positive pressure in there easily. So people. Oh, we lost Paul. Let me, let me bring in, uh, let me bring in Ken. Ken, you, you've been using ketamine in EMS maybe longer than anybody. What, what, what are your thoughts on, on, uh, on ketamine if you're there? Well, we already knew the answer. Uh, ketamine is the right medicine in all situations. Whether it's intubation, seizure, uh, violence, pain control. I mean, we, we we already knew that answer. But I do appreciate the extra data showing showing that back up. And, and one of the areas we specifically use it is for hemodynamically unstable patients because of its favorable pro profile. So it's it's good to see the data back that up. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Paul, we lost you. Yeah, I know. I don't know what happened, but at least my face, my face is back, right? So yeah, yeah. I, yeah, once again, everybody can now feel. Was that too long winded, or did you hear everything I was talking about? Uh, about yeah. all the various things that uh, alter this. Okay, good. But I, I was saying in the end, I should come back and talk about ventilation, particularly in people who have no preload, etc. So I was going to uh, say, so I was going to say, yeah, we we ought, we ought to have that. You come on and just do it. Uh, talk like that specifically. I'll 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 set you up with a date on that. That's okay. Um, all right. Well, listen, we're at the yeah. bottom of the hour. So, uh, yeah, Peter, did you hear about my thing about that? The, uh, uh, you know, that we did this other study and that we actually showed that there was a survival benefit to ketamine, even though acutely in the acute period, there was some hemodynamic, um, you know, problems. OK, yeah, uh, so I, def def I definitely want to see that uh, as, as big as a big proponent of ketamine as well. I want to see that as well. Um, all right, well, um, Brian, it's the bottom of the hour. Give us a last word. If you know you're talking to EMS leaders, medical directors from look uh, from across the country here, um, give us a last word on what your thoughts are here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think uh, my last word would be what we do at Hennepin. I think is a pretty reasonable practice: is pick a standard dose for adult patients, whatever you're going to use for RSI, and just ditch the weight based dose. Give a standard dose that's going to work, and uh, simplify that so you can focus on more important things. That's a great, great words of advice. And again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to join us. Thank you for your contributions to the literature. I'm going to check out your other paper as well and uh, hope to stay in touch. And feel free to join us every week, every Friday yeah. as well. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, guys. Yeah, very thoughtful. Again, that was done in a very thoughtful, really good manner. So thanks again. Really, okay, so. My awesome. pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys.